Up until today, there has been a good amount of video games set in H.P. Lovecraft's universe of eldritch horror, with several very promising new titles being in development at the very moment. And if we would add all the games that took direct and open inspiration from his literary legacy, this list would become endlessly long. Lovecraft's unique brand of horror brings a very specific challenge to any developer who attempts to turn the Cthulhu mythos into a video game. The feeling of cosmic disempowerment. In these stories, characters often stumble upon tiny fragments of arcane knowledge that, upon closer inspection, seems too weird, too outlandish in nature to not be a product of someone's freakish imagination. But yet, somehow, the protagonists always feel themselves driven by an inexplicable curiosity to dig deeper, until they unearth that fraction of a cosmic truth so grand in scale, so horrifying in nature, that their only option to cope is insanity. Or death. Lovecraft's world is an alternate timeline in which an ancient, malevolent race of deities puppeteers the fates of humanity with the sadistic ferocity of a boy who tortures a colony of ants for amusement. Video games are and have always been a medium of empowerment. The player's road might be paved with tough challenges and frustration at times, but game design teaches us to eventually reward players with a feeling of accomplishment for overcoming the challenges the games put up. A pat on the shoulder. But this is exactly what a true Lovecraftian game should avoid like rabies. The essence of eldritch horror is the feeling that the mere notion of challenging these ancient forces is so ludicrous that madness is the only possible outcome of such a venture. If a Lovecraftian outer god were to pat you on the shoulder, it would crush your soul with such an immensity that it would turn into a black hole, or something like that. But players emerging victoriously when opposing these omnipotent manifestations of pure evil goes fundamentally against what the genre stands for. And yet, so many Lovecraft video game adaptations are guilty of it in one way or another. Now, after such a build-up, you probably expect that in this video we're gonna talk about that one video game adaptation that actually managed to get it right. Right? But, well, no. I'm sorry. Today's game is probably one of the most symptomatic examples for this very phenomenon. A game that shows a plethora of love and passion for the universe it's set in, that shows promise in how it sets up its world, its characters and its narrative, but that ultimately lacks the courage to completely pull it off in the end. It's a game with many obvious shortcomings, as you're about to find out. But despite all of that, it remains a great example of the narrative power behind the world of H.P. Lovecraft as it still effortlessly manages to pull the player into its uncanny and otherworldly detective story. Call of Cthulhu Shadow of the Comet is a refreshingly different graphic adventure thriller that, up until today, 25 years after its release, remains one of my favorite forgotten gems. Released originally for MS-DOS in 1993, Shadow of the Comet is a graphic adventure in the image of Sierra's lineup of classic adventure games. While moving the character directly across the screen with the keyboard, we solve inventory and dialogue puzzles that range from straightforward and intuitive, clever and logical to, typical for the genre, sometimes ludicrously contrived. And just like in the good old Sierra classics, your character can die in a multitude of ways if you don't watch out. Or sometimes even if you are vigilant, because this game comes with a fair share of cheap deaths that feel nearly unavoidable, trust me. Poor Parker. So young, and already in the next world. To old Sierra fans, this almost comical death toll in adventure games was one of the most entertaining features, while many other people, myself included, generally preferred the design philosophy of don't bludgeon a player over the head for being curious in a genre that's all about curiosity. But I gotta admit, in a dark and menacing setting such as the Call of Cthulhu, the sense of unpredictable danger this evokes 
just makes a lot of sense. So as long as you follow the drill, save often, save early, and use multiple saves, you're gonna be just fine. We assume the role of John Parker, a British journalistic photographer who gets commissioned to travel to the New England town of Innsmouth in 1910, uh, I'm sorry, I mean Illsmouth, in order to capture the upcoming passing of Halley's Comet. Parker had recently discovered that roughly 80 years ago, the researcher Lord Bolleskin had found the town to be a remarkable location for the survey of astronomical objects with unparalleled clarity compared to anywhere else on Earth. And so he had observed the previous passing of the comet from Hillsmouth in 1834. But during his stay, something unforeseen had occurred, for he apparently lost his mind and spent the rest of his days locked away in the St. Andrews Hospital for the Insane. Parker arrives in the remote port town three days before the comet's arrival, and he sets out on an investigation into the circumstances of Bolleskin's findings and tries to uncover what had really happened to him. One thing that Shadow of the Comet achieved remarkably well right from the moment Parker sets foot into Illsmouth is establishing that subtle, uncanny feeling of unease, the subliminal notion that something isn't quite right in this secluded coastal town. An atmosphere of suspicion that strongly resembles classic Lovecraft stories like The Shadow Over Innsmouth. And in fact, the game's story is in many ways an amalgamation of this novella and the short story The Dunwich Horror. When we begin exploring the streets and houses of Illsmouth, completely free and largely without any artificial restraints, wherever we go, we can't help but feel observed. Every person we meet knows more than they tell us, and people we've never met before seem to be uncomfortably familiar with who we are and what we're up to. Those who reject our presence here show themselves a tad too curious, and those who assist us always seem suspiciously over-eager. If you don't like my price, mister, uh... Parker. John T. Parker. Why didn't you say so? I'll take you there for nothing. Shadow of the Comet gets this feeling right through attention to detail and character building. A nervous twitch in the eyes here, a slightly too excited reaction to something a character should have no knowledge about there, and sometimes just this uncomfortable feeling of xenophobia everywhere. Very true to the author who inspired it. So, over the course of the three days until Halley's Comet arrives, we're the new dick in town. The private detective, I mean. We talk with people and investigate the town on our hunt for clues until... Now, I don't want to spoil too much since finding out what's really going on in Illsmouth is the biggest appeal of the game. Let me just say that not all is as it seems with the families who have been residing here for generations. There's intrigue, conspiracy, and maybe an even darker secret, one that has been hidden from the world for centuries. And maybe the celestial event that's about to occur might have a greater significance than just being a sight for sore eyes. But we sadly have to flip the coin for a moment, because one of the biggest hurdles to enjoying this game as it was intended are undoubtedly the controls. The general idea behind the system is straightforward, but there are many situations in which it is executed thoughtlessly, and that can arise frustration. For instance, at one point, you're supposed to rub a piece of alcohol-soaked cotton on a painting to uncover a hidden message. But since the engine doesn't allow directly combining two items within your inventory, and you have to first place the painting down on a table, and despite there being like, what, 10 different tables across Illsmouth, it of course only works on one very specific table for no other reason than that being the one table that the programmers chose for this puzzle. Stuff like that is just really dumb. But once you learn how to communicate to the game's engine what you want Parker to do, it works pretty okay for the biggest part. But you have to be aware that compared to most other point-and-click adventures of its time, and of course the decades that came after, the controls often feel incredibly clumsy and sometimes outright annoying. Things like these can make it really infuriating at times, when you know what the game wants you to do for a long time, but you simply have no means to communicate it to the engine with the tools you're given. Useless. There are other segments that, especially from a modern point of view, can be more than just a little bit tedious, and that's situations of time danger. 
Old games like these are sometimes badly translated to modern CPU cycles, which results in running much faster than they used to on ancient old computers. And that, for example, can make avoiding eldritch monsters in the dark with a viewing distance from your nose to your fingertips turn into a next to impossible task that I'm sure was never intended to feel like this. This technical cycle problem also makes the subtitles and the voice dialogue go completely out of sync all the time, and despite my best efforts to mess with DOSBox's CPU cycles and other solutions suggested online, I have not been able to fix this issue. And it is really daunting to play the game like this, since you often have to wait up to 10 to 15 seconds between lines of dialogue. ...of a particular branch of the Micmac tribe, a branch known as They Who Worship the Night Howler. By Night Howler they meant Nyarlathotep. How did you hear about him? We met. He almost killed me. But since the voice acting was actually only a later CD-ROM edition of the game that wasn't in the original release, and that voice acting ranges from sometimes passably decent to, especially later in the game when characters are shouting a lot, more cringeworthy than nails on chalkboard. You pay for this. Go Mercy I highly recommend playing this game text only. It makes it much more easy to take the game seriously and you avoid both the cringy voice acting and the syncing problems with the subtitles, so it's betting two dogs with one stroke. There is another trap I must warn you of before you approach Shadow of the Comet for the first time, and that is the age-old adventure design atrocity of dead-end inventory items. This can happen when the game requires an object from Area A to solve a puzzle in Area B. If the player is able to finish Area A without picking up and keeping the object in their inventory, and if they have no means to acquire the object anymore once they are in Area B, the game has reached an unwinnable state, a dead end. A famously nasty example for this is the Yeti Pie situation in Zeras King's Quest V, where you have to defeat a Yeti later in the game with a custard pie you get from a baker in an early part of the game but you can either finish the entire first area of the game without ever buying the pie, or even worse, as the game even strongly encourages you to, you can just eat the pie and thereby lose it from your inventory for good without ever knowing you need it later. It feels like doing the right thing at the time, but once you encounter the Yeti, you have no means to, nor any clues as to why you can't proceed in the goddamn game. And Shadow of the Comet sadly also inherits this nasty staple of atrocious puzzle design from Sierra, containing a good bunch of items that players can't potentially overlook, but that are mandatory for solving later puzzles without the possibility to backtrack anymore, and that lead to very frustrating, unsolvable dead ends if you're not super careful. Or sometimes even if you're careful, because most of these items are neither properly telegraphed, nor is their later use foreshadowed at the time. There's no other way to put it, this problem is simply a result of poor design, so don't feel too bad for sometimes looking up a walkthrough to avoid this. My opinion. So yeah, as I've tried to highlight at great length in this video, Call of Cthulhu Shadow of the Comet comes with a plethora of minor and major annoyances. From unfair puzzle design, over infuriatingly clumsy controls and sometimes cringe-worthy voice acting in the CD version, and maybe the biggest faux pas of it all that I haven't mentioned yet, I don't want to spoil it for you, but it's the ending of the game. Shadow of the Comet goes to great lengths to establish a truly Lovecraftian feeling throughout the biggest part of its game, and yet at the end it just... it just slaps all of this in the face with almost comedic proportions. It really feels like the ending was written by an entirely different person or a team, as if it was originally conceived to be hopeless, dark and deprecating, respectful of the source material like most of the game but was then later changed by someone who felt that players must be rewarded for their efforts instead of punished. 
but honestly, to me, that is why this game is such a standout example for Lovecraft adaptations to me. It manages to botch everything in the last five minutes. I really don't want to spoil the ending itself for you, and maybe you think about it differently for those who want to play it. So if you're curious, either give it a shot yourself, or if you're impatient or have already finished the game, I've added the very scene that perfectly summarizes this game's ludicrously flawed ending after the credits of this video. You'll see what I mean. So yeah, Shadow of the Comet has many flaws, as I said, including a finale that would make Howard Phillips pound the lid of his coffin in a wild fury. And yet, despite all of its shortcomings, I'm speaking out a recommendation here to try it out for yourself. It is the first ever attempt to turn the literary universe of H.P. Lovecraft into a graphic adventure, and for that it manages to get a remarkable amount of things right from the get-go. More so than many other titles that came after it. Its nostalgia-inducing 256 color VGA graphics still emit a very unique early adventure-era charm, and especially in the darker, eerier parts later on, the backgrounds and animations sometimes deliver an incredibly foreboding and satisfyingly spooky atmosphere. The segment of the Illsmouth Cemetery at night and its maze-like system of hidden catacombs slithering beneath the town streets is by far one of my favorite parts of the game, as it perfectly captures the feeling of Eldritch in glorious 320 by 200 pixels. Which is, I said it before, the game's real strong suit. This looming feeling that something larger than life is lingering behind the smokescreen of perception. With its meager technical capabilities, and developed on a shoestring budget at the time, in the game's best moments, Infogram manages to imbue Shadow of the Comet with an almost Lynchian flair of surrealism. I usually like to spend my time making videos with almost exclusively praising games, rather than bickering about things I'm not satisfied with. You have the rest of YouTube for that. And I've probably been talking about more flaws with this game than in any other video before, but my reason for this is to give you a clear and honest picture of the hurdles that await you. Because I think it's worth it. In my opinion, this game is a must-play for any fan of H.P. Lovecraft's eldritch universe of cosmic horror and anyone who enjoys a detective story with a paranormal twist and a penchant for sinister mystery. Just give it a try. You can get it dirt cheap on GOG and Steam, and both versions are DOSBox fueled and run pretty flawlessly, except for the things that I mentioned before. So I hope that with this video, I could make Call of Cthulhu Shadow of the Comet a little less of a forgotten gem. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this little excursion into a video game oblivion. As always, if you have a game you think deserves to get the Forgotten Gems treatment, share it in the comments and add hashtag gem suggestions. Many titles covered in this series came from your recommendations, so keep them coming, this is fun. If you're enjoying this series or the videos on my channel in general, why not consider supporting my work with a dollar on Patreon, so I can pay rent, food and everything I need to keep making more videos. Just click the card in the top right that just popped up or follow the link in the description to pitch in. So thank you to anyone who already supports me on Patreon, with this month's top tier supporters being Arsène Moccasin, Jean Boring, Quentin Prodome, Thwagam, Chuck Taylor, Nicolas Sorosa Pooch, Tony Flesher, Evan Tickre, Kiris Tarhaku, Murak Sardis, Anne Vu, Chen Wei, Morgan Zickels, Cameron Richter, Micha Nestler, Rok Sakrajek, Susanna Maria, Lee Arnold, Dominic Hitai Bako, Adam Burr, Vladimir Baciu, Kasper Ram, Cholek, Ariel Guzman, Robin Clausen, Andrei Kriakushin, Jonathan Irwin, Adriel Garcia, Liam Jones, Lucas, James Lynch, Cleish Hie, Vida Daly, Nick Lazell, Malam, Matt Davis, Yulia, David Nadeau, the Melting Squad, Sean Quigley, Angrim, Roman Vasenmüller, Nathan de Grand, Alex Lake, Carlos Spilari, Syriac Neth Eliasson, Augustin Ortega, Maxwell Brown, Max Herbert, 
Joseph Jones, David Zelenak, Karl Jura, Martin Schmidt, Brian Vieira, Adam Cross, Michael Spiner IV, Dennis Pfefferkorn, Mr. Burgadon, Philipp Kirchner, Midorino, Chase Ladner, Pascal Fairling, Milan Vujinovic, Sebastian Garcia, Jacob Woodward, and Nicholas Stevenson. Until next time, ta ta! What are you all doing here? Dear Mr. Parker, I'm not much of a hand at making speeches. Well, that's a joke. He talked for two hours at the Temperance League meeting. Jed Donahue, will you kindly let the doctor get on with it? Well, doctor, we're waiting. Thank you. Well, as I was saying... What was I saying? Oh, yes. Well, here we are, gathered together. Even Swing managed to find time to get away from his break to be here. You're speaking ill of a public official. Will you let me get on with this? There. Well, to get to the point, we want to say... Thank you! Thank you! Oh, well, to be honest... There is no more to be said. You've scattered the comet's shadow. That's something we can never forget. Now you'd better get going. Your boat won't wait. Goodbye. Hey, find a fine old pub and drink to my health. Goodbye, Parker. I might just do that, Jed. Thanks again for the photo of the stone circle. My pleasure.